Good morning. Oh, well, that's very, very loud. Wow. Uh, good morning. Um, as Ashkan said, my name is Jim Hefner. Uh, I'm the co-owner of Just Float in Pasadena. Like you said, we're the world's largest float center. We have 11 tanks, um, or in our case, we have 11 cabins we have there. Um, and what I would like to do is I'm going to share how I got to this point um, in just three and a half short years since my first float, and now uh, standing before you, this is really kind of a dream come true. So thank you for letting me be here. And, um, Share, share, share my story. So, little vision board here, um, kind of inspiration. Fellow on the left there, Mr. Joe Rogan. Um, can I see a show of hands how many people first heard about floating through Rogan or somehow other through Rogan? Um, or at least you know, one of their close friends through Rogan then got you to go do it? Okay, that's kind, that's kind of what I thought, like maybe 20%. Um, yeah, just a, a great advocate for floating. Um, UFC commentator, a comedian, and podcaster, and has a float tank in his house, and um, just been a big advocate for the float industry. He's based down in LA, and um, you know, about 20% of our new business comes because he referred them, or they heard him talk about it. So, um, and I'm very grateful to him, because through him is how I heard about floating for the very first time. Um, it was about six years ago, I heard him talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. Um, never got a chance to do it. No float centers around me. What a surprise. Had to drive an hour one direction to go float in this little lovely float center. And um, suffice to say, that first float was profound. Um, I stepped out of the float tank and was completely convinced that this was something that people needed to have access to. Um, you know, my personal development and sort of transformation along the way since I've been floating. Um, and, and it's whatever sort of word or superlative you're going to try to come up with to describe floating, um, profound and whatever, there's sort of, you know, you know, you know, consciousness, sort of connection, source, all these things. It's, it's, it's all of that, but the language really doesn't do it justice. And those, those of you that, of course, are in this room float sort of knows that. So, um, but uh, anyway. Um, so my background, how I got here, just because I had my first float and I was blown away, um, I know I'm not the only one that's had that experience. Um, my background, um, serial entrepreneur my entire career, entire life for that matter. I was the kid in the neighborhood that was cutting lawns and um, you know, ba you know, babysitting and perhaps in high school slung a bag of weed or two, but that's a separate conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, so over three decades, entrepreneur, owned lots of different businesses, um, created them um, beginning to end, ruined a couple of them, some gone sideways, but that's the story of the entrepreneur, of course. Um, my education, both my degrees are in business, including I have an MBA. Um, getting into this space, sort of the wellness space or floating, totally new thing for me, not what I was doing before. Um, so a little bit, little bit outside the box, but like I said, for my very first float, um, it, 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 it was very obvious that this, this was something people needed to have access to. And um, that's what we set out to do. Um, also on that day, my wife and I on the right there, as you can see, she's very pregnant. Um, the time I was having my very first float, she was in a joining room, seven months pregnant with our daughter. Um, while she was listening to her own heartbeat and baby's heartbeat, uh, sort of in sync with hers. I was in the adjoining room having this very profound moving thing, got out of the tank, and she was, you know, she was, she was very moved with her experience, slightly different than mine. And, um, you know, and, and, and on that moment, I mean, as I was driving, as we were driving home, um, called, one of my, called one of my business partners, Michael Rusco, and said, dude, I found this thing. He, of course, never heard of it. Found this thing, there's a box, there's water, it's dark, oh shit, you go in there, it's so awesome. I'm telling, I'm telling you, I am going to do this. Um, and I didn't know what or how, we didn't set out to build the biggest float center, um, had no idea what that looked like. We sort of, you know, the, you know, the, the early stages, kind of this fact-finding thing, we're all over the place. Um, 
but knew I was going to be in the float industry. I knew that was going to be the career for, for the rest of my life, and I remain um, completely convinced that it is. I'm not doing anything else other than floating people for the rest of my life. So um, it's quite an honor to be. It's, thank you. Yeah, and it's 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 you know it's an honor to be in front of all of you, and and the um, yeah, it was a long long process. Um, you know, besides the baby up there, as you can see, there's sort of a couple of other sort of action things. Um, I didn't realize till after, right about the time we opened, um, so it took about two and a half years from the time I had my first float to the time we opened. We manufacture our own tanks now. We went, and you'll see some more of that. Um, but it took me about two years, right around the time that we were opening, that why did I fall in love with floating so quickly? And I'll, and I'll, and I'll be brief, because it's a little bit self-indulgent, but... Um, I've been in sort of action or adventure sports my entire life, I'm very attracted to these things. Used to think maybe it was the danger thing, um, you know, the adrenaline thing, um, but came to realize after about, you know, sort of two years and a couple hundred floats that the reason I fell in love with it so quickly was is that there's very much about the flow state. These, these activities are, they require complete concentration and focus. And, and, and never really you know, sort of pieced it together, but that's why I fell in love, love, love with floating you know, from the very beginning. It felt very familiar to me. I was home. I was home without the activity, though. I was home without the danger. It was very accessible. So, um, yeah, just, uh, I, yeah, I still... So, the journey begins. What does it look like? What are we gonna do? Um, my, my first float, top center there, float lounge, people down in Laguna Beach, um, two tank float center, the loveliest people that you'll ever meet that run a float center. And to this day, we've modeled everything that we do at Just Float. As far as the customer interaction and how we deal with people, we are, we are appreciative of the fact that they are there. We welcome them. We love them. We want to help them with their practice. We are authentic. And they set the model for us on that. And I still think about them all the time. Um, of course, the float on boys, everybody knows about those guys. Within a week of my first float, um, had discovered who they were on the phone, what's going on. Um, probably three or four weeks later after that, my business partner and I, Mike, were flying up to Portland. What the hell's going on? Gonna meet these guys, what's their deal? Um, float away, Colin, Ginny, um, and you'll see Colin's coming on after me. Um, very, very smart man, loves floating, knows a lot about building float tanks, got a hold of him with immediately and was trying to pick his brain. Anybody that knew anything about floating, I wanted to know all about it. I, I knew I was going to be in it, a little, little bit compulsive perhaps, but that's me. Uh, Kevin at Zero Gravity, thanks to him, awesome, same thing, um, awesome float center down in Austin. Um, been around floating for a really long time, gets it, same thing, you know, really focused on the customer experience from the beginning to the end, time they walk in the door to the time they leave. Your responsibility to be awesome at what you do. I know there's lots of probably perspective and new float center operators in here. Um, so stay, fo stay focused on your clients. That's gonna be a recurring thing. Flo float, float house boys, um, I'm sure they're here somewhere. Um, you know, thanks to you for the inspiration for going big. Um, without you, we wouldn't have done it. We certainly did not try to one-up you with your nine tanks in Vancouver. Uh, just happened to be the size building that we got, how many tanks we could get in there, that's how we ended up with 11, nothing more than that, that's it. Um, so thanks to you for the inspiration for doing it, because we saw you guys doing it before us, and we follow right behind you, so thank you. Uh, and the, the, the character on the bottom there, Justin Feinstein, um, lots of you here to see him. Um, he actually had his first float about the same time as I did, um, it was based, based out of LA, um, he and I, Struck up a fast friendship, um, has, um, I guess similar to me, very big picture vision thing, loves floating, um, and really wants to push this along. So um, yeah, Justin has been a very dear friend and colleague since then. And we, while he was building his center in Tulsa, we were building in Pasadena. And along the way, we collaborated on just about everything. And for that, I'm very grateful. How we do the soundproofing, and how are you gonna do your doors, and how are you gonna do the threshold when you go into your room? All of these details are important, and he, like me, sweated every damn detail, and that's why he has an awesome research place. So, um, anyway. So, moving into a new space, like any good entrepreneur, I'm gonna evaluate risk. What are my risks? What's happening here? And the water quality was the one thing that struck me immediately as being a big concern. There was no data to support how people were disinfecting float tanks. What's happening here? Um, besides the disinfection and the client safety concern of risk, 
But there was also the risk of the health regulator coming in and preventing us from opening our business. That was real risk. I was very concerned about that. I spent a lot of time trying to learn, and I have zero scientific background, but spent a lot of time trying to learn about water quality and, and what, what, what we were going to do about it. We hired, we went through three different water, sort of whatever, recreational water consultants to help us understand what was going on. Um, the first two we hired, bromine, chlorine, you have to do it. What do you, like, and, and, and I was just adamant from day one, like I can't, I, can't, I can't do it, and I can't do it not because what I learned later about the disinfection byproducts that are very dangerous to inhale, but the reason I didn't want to do it early on was just because of the odor. It was very simple. It can't smell in my float center. It's not gonna smell like an indoor pool. I refuse to do that. I'm not gonna do it. So, of course, UV, you know, UV peroxide was our solution, or the thing that everybody was, seemed to be using the most, and certainly with no reported health incidents, that seemed to make sense. That, okay, we're gonna go that direction. Um, in that pursuit, found Bob Crandall. Um, Bob Crandall, he's here somewhere, I'm sure. Um, he, he, too, has been an awesome mentor in teaching me about water quality, but what Bob's, um, Bob's history and background, he, back in the 80s, pioneered UV peroxide in the use of hot tubs, and actually did a lot of research back on it um, back, in, back then in the 80s, and he was successful at getting, I don't know, like 150 regulators around the country in their jurisdiction to allow UV peroxide in the use of recreational water. So this was the guy, and I happened to sort of, and I found him, yeah, it was, through, through 15 people, I finally found him. He was in retirement and up in Sacramento, and I, you know, get him on the phone finally, and float tanks the thing, and he's like, what? What, are you t what, 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 what is all this? And I'm like, well, it's, it, and so, but now Bob's here for his, you know, for his second year, and um, he too has been a really great um, ally and advocate for the UV peroxide, and uh, yeah, so for him, I'm very grateful as well. It's a portable CO2 meter. Measures CO2 in the atmosphere. A um, little bit geeky, totally not my thing to be geeky or techy at all, but a little bit, little bit here. Um, CO2 is a byproduct of your own human respiration. Um, it's not good in high concentrations. Um, ambient level in this room right now is about 400 parts per million. Um, put people in small and closed spaces, breathing for hour or longer, CO2 levels build up. Toxic levels, this is a problem. Probably one of the most controversial things I'm gonna say all morning. Um, how many of you have had float experiences around the 45 minute mark, have had a feeling that it's getting stuffy in there? Holy shit. That's what I thought. By my, whatever, fifth float, I'm thinking about what's happening in the float tank, what's happening in the water, what's happening in the air. Bought a portable CO2 meter and just drop, drop it in there. What I found from 400 ambient within 45 minutes at 10,000 parts per million, within an hour, 15,000 parts per million, those are near toxic levels. This is not unique to that particular float tank I was in. Um, I, it, it, I feel a little uncomfortable delivering this to the, in, you know, sort of the industry collectively, but this is something we have to do better. Um, I traveled around, uh, my partner and I, actually he floated a bunch of different places well, but we took CO2 loggers and we floated in a bunch of different style tanks out there. And there are virtually none out there that handle the air effectively. So, in my opinion, this is a very dirty little secret of the people in this room. So if you manufacture float tanks or you're opening a float center, please buy one of these. Learn how to use it, understand it. The air quality is important. We have people in there for long periods of time. Pay attention to it. Float cabin. Nothing really to see here. Um, as I mentioned, we began manufacturing our own tanks. Um, went cabin style. Um, it seemed to make the most sense for us. Um, the huge percentage of the clients that come to us are all first-time floaters, want to make it very accessible to them. Step right into it. Certainly, I have floated in everything that looks like this. I have absolutely nothing against them. But if you're going to buy style tanks like this, please keep in mind that will li limit the audience that you're going to get. Percentage, I won't even speculate, but I see this all the time in our center. I have people come in, and they're talking to me about their first float and their first float experience. And they see our rooms, and we open the door in the cabin, and like, wow. And 
They're like, oh yeah, I saw pictures of all those other ones and I couldn't do that. There's just no way. I hear this all the time. And this is not a knock on any of these tanks. I love floating all of them. But just be aware, if you're going to buy them, you're not going to reach as wide an audience as you could. Electronics, whatever. You guys build float tanks, you know what these things look like. Um, my business partner, Mike, jumped in with automation engineer, consultant that we hired, knows way more about this stuff than me. All I know is this stuff is magic and the shit works. But. <laughs> So this kind of looks like a float center. This is our building um, when we got it. Um, you know, long, long hallway, lots of rooms. Look, some float tanks will fit just fine in there, right? Well, kind of not really. <laughs> Take it all down. Um, our building is actually a big L shape, so this is just the front part of our building here. But as you can see, and if you've already built a float center, there's really nothing to see here. It's not really that remarkable. It's just knocking a bunch of walls down. It's just dirty, nasty, hard work. Um, so there, now it's all cleaned out, shiny. Again, the front part of our building, the back part goes to the right there. Um, we have four tanks up here in our lounge and break room and reception, everything is in the front now. Anyway, so it's all cleaned out, uh, we're ready to go. And so now we have to put some holes in the floor because that seemed like to make a lot of sense. Um, those of you that have built centers or are going to be building centers, the showers are very difficult. What are you gonna do with the drains? How are you, how are you gonna get the water out of the room and down the drain from the shower? So I wish, you, I wish you luck on that. I have not figured out the perfect way to do this. This is horribly expensive, but a great way to do it. We have big sloping changing rooms, sloping showers, and a big trench drain in the middle. It's awesome, works beautifully well. Horribly expensive. Walls going up, whatever, drywall going on, big curvy wall there. First group of six float tanks arriving. Of course, they don't come assembled, especially when you manufacture them. So uh, my partner Mike there, uh, 15,000 pounds of salt, our first order. Pretty exciting, again, that stuff doesn't move itself. Um, our families, families, lots of sacrifice. Um, my partner Mike, his wife Sarah on the left there, my wife Annalisa, our daughter Sierra over there. Um, everybody here um, in that picture, great deal of sacrifice, commitment uh, for them. I'm very appreciative, especially my dear wife who tolerates my crazy ass ideas all the time. Uh, and provides my compass for doing the right thing always. Uh, there we go, we're almost ready to go. Opening, and that's what our float center looks like. Reception area. Um, so, there we go. There we go. Okay, hallway, nothing too remarkable there. Lounge, nothing remarkable, just kind of quick run through. Boys at Helm, thank you for the awesome software. Um, we looked at all the other ones out there, you know, you know, Spa Booker and MBO. We actually opened with Front Desk, found them horrible, unreliable. Um, the Helm stuff for running a float center, absolutely look at it very carefully because we, we found it to be a godsend for us. Okay, so I'm gonna have to wrap up. I'm seeing getting a little bit low, lower on time than I expected. Sorry for the ramblings. Um, so challenges for the industry and my, my business going forward is things that I see. Um, Three C's. Um, first, we have consistency. Consistency in service delivery. Um, make sure your water is perfect. Make sure your air is perfect. Make sure you greet your clients warmly and all the time. From beginning to end, do a great job. Your business will do much better because of that. <sighs> Communication. Um, how we talk about floating is a very interesting thing. Um, to your clients, to the press, in, in your marketing communication. Um, it's float therapy, it's flotation therapy. Um, sensory deprivation, isolation tanks, please let these words go. They're not doing us any favors anymore. They, re they really aren't. Um, they're, far, they're far too ominous for, to, you know, if we want to take this to the mainstream, which is certainly my vision, is to float everybody, I want it, that, that has to be addressed. Um, also REST, the acronym REST, um, scientists guys love it, I totally get it, it's fine, it's, you know, it's, clumsy. it's clumsy in your marketing, it's clumsy to your clients, um, if you are going to use REST, um, sort of get rid of the restricted word and just use reduced, um, that's actually Justin's advice, um, we of course talk and sweat about all of these details. Competition, competition has arrived, it's all here, it's okay. Nobody knows what floating is yet. News. <laughs> so when the float center opens near you, don't get worked up. Call them. Greet them. Of course, I haven't called the, the float center that just opened near us, so I apologize. I'm going to talk to you guys later. Been, been busy. Um, 
It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Again, nobody knows what floating is. Reach out with them. Collaborate on what you're going to do. Collaborate on your communication, on your marketing efforts. Expand the pie. Don't get worked up in your little, the little slice of pie that you've already developed. That's not going to help. We're not floating enough people yet. We're just getting going. This is the beginning of all of this. Think big. Think long term. Think float everyone. Big percentages. Before I get too far off, I just had, of course, I'm totally freestyling the whole thing, and I'm not even looking at my notes. I'm sure I left something out, but one thing just occurred to me. Um, also in the communication, I'll be very brief on this. Um, things that are very controversial, the things that also I think should be removed from our, our, our language that we use describing this, and I apologize for the people I'm going to offend, Mr. John Lilly. Awesome. Thank you for the invention. Very beautiful. I am incredibly appreciative for the gift that you gave us. However, um, Far too controversial for us to touch. Let it go, please. Do yourself a favor. So, in closing, um, many of our clients are in need of healing, not just relaxation. Floating is not just special, it's sacred. We are able to be transformed through floating and we, might get, to, and we get to share that gift with others. The most successful float centers are infused with this idealism from the top down. It's become part of their culture. Focus on your own floating practice and be present. Love your clients, that's why you're there. Support their well-being and your business success will follow. Thank you. <laughs>